Well, welcome, guys. I'm so glad to be here with you. Happy New Year, okay? I want to be the first to say that to you. 2022 has been laid to rest, all right? It can't hurt you anymore. It's 2023, and I am excited about what God is going to do in and through Family Church in this new year. And we're actually beginning the new year in a, in a bit of a different way. We've been walking kind of verse by verse through some passages over the last 12 weeks. Today, we're going to begin a series we're calling the DNA series. And this is going to be a kind of a topical series where we're looking at who are we as Family Church? Like, why do we exist? What's the mission of Family Church? Does anybody know the mission statement of Family Church? People helping people find and follow Jesus. That's right. So we're going to kind of unpack over the next several weeks what that is. And why is it important? And, and how do I actually live that out? Right? People helping people is simply disciples making disciple makers. Right? The disciples make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. When we talk about multiplication, you may have heard us talk about that in the past. That's what we mean. The disciples who make disciples who make disciples. But sometimes discipleship sounds like this big lofty goal and, and difficult. And we kind of can very easily excuse ourselves from that um, because it feels overwhelming. And so our hope throughout this series is kind of twofold. Firstly, to show why this is so important. And secondly, how we can partner together to actually live out people helping people find and follow Jesus. So I'm excited about this. Um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16 today. I've titled this message, Jesus's Church, because Jesus is going to give us a vision of his church in Matthew 16 that I think is going to kind of blow all our categories out of the water. Okay. So our opening question, I want us to just kind of evaluate for a second. When, when, when you think about the church, what is your vision of the church? When I was a kid, I didn't go to church a lot, right? And, 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 so when I thought of church, I thought of a building that smells like dust and cleaning agents. Um, I thought of pews. I thought of hymnals, even though I didn't know what those things were. I thought of uh, people who wore ties and dresses and always smiled at me. I thought of uh, stained glass. But what, what do you think of when you think of the church? Do you think, I'm, I'm going to the church, I'm going to a location? Or, or do you maybe think of a, a gathering of God's people on Sunday? Today, as we look at Jesus, he vision casts for his disciples what this church is going to be, that it's his church. And ultimately, I think we're going to see that it's going to blow all of our categories out of the water. So let's jump right in. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, I'm going to pause right there. You may say, Jason, we're half a sentence in. Let's get going, man. But this is important, okay? Caesarea Philippi was a, a, a location that was steeped in rampant idolatry. There was a, at one time a temple to the god Pan there. There was a temple to the god Baal there. Uh, they worshiped these false gods in disgusting and depraved ways, sometimes including human sacrifice, other times including sexual sin. And, and so this is, a, this is an area that is utterly hopeless. This is an area of just darkness and, and, and people who have been deceived by these false religions and false gods. In fact, they, they created monuments to them. Over here on the right of this image, those, those carvings that are carved into the, the stone there, those are altars to the god Pan, where they would sacrifice sometimes even their children to this false god. And to the left there, there's this giant cave, and that's called the Gates of Hades or the Gates of Hell, which is super interesting because in the text we're about to read, Jesus actually uses that phrase and, and, and says, we're going to triumph over it. And the pagan mind at the day thought that the gods wintered in the gates of Hades so they could stay warm in the underworld. It's kind of silly to us, but, but this is the backdrop that Jesus has. This pagan, idolatrous area is the backdrop of one of the most hope-filled, life-giving, amazing, astounding passages about who Jesus is and what his church is. All right, so we're going we're gonna to jump into that. That's the backdrop. And he's talking to his disciples. He asks his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? He's checking the polls, okay? Lots of opinions. What are people saying? And they said, some say John the Baptist. 
Others say Elijah and others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. There's lots of opinions back then, just like there is today, right? Some people say Jesus is a liar or he's crazy or he's a philosopher or he's a higher moral ethic to live up to or he's a good teacher. But back then they said, hey, he's John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a national reformer calling God's people to repent and turn back to God. And they saw Jesus in his ministry and they said, man, he's calling people to repentance and place their faith back in God. Or others said Elijah, Elijah, the miracle worker. Remember when Elijah was on top of the mountain, built an altar to God, put a sacrifice on that altar, then doused the whole thing in water. And without even lighting a match, the whole thing gets consumed with fire as Elijah prays and God rains fire down from heaven, consumes the whole thing. It's an awesome picture. And they see Jesus and the amazing miracles that he's doing. And they're like, he must be like Elijah. And then others say he's like Jeremiah or one of the prophets. They heard Jesus teach. And they said, this is a man who teaches with authority and power. He must be like one of the prophets who spoke the very words of God. You see what's so interesting about all these opinions? is They saw godly things in Jesus. They just didn't see that Jesus is God incarnate. They saw that Jesus spoke with power of the Lord. They saw that Jesus healed and did miracles that only the Lord could do, but they didn't recognize him for who he truly was. And these are the people who had been studying and anticipating Christ's coming, the Messiah who would come to rescue God's people. And they missed it. And so Jesus then, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So the first question was just really a preface for the the deeper heart question here. Okay, who do you say I am? Let's get personal here. And Simon Peter replied, Simon's the guy who if there's a question, he's answering it. He's the guy, me, pick me in class. You know, he's like, he's always got all the answers. Most of the time he puts his foot in his mouth. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the delivering king who we've been waiting for, who we've heard about for generations. But more than that, you're the son of the living God. You are God in the flesh. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon Peter. Simon Bar-Jonah just means Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Jesus is like, Peter, this didn't come because of your own intellect or your own spiritual prowess, man. This, This was an open book test. But my Father who is in heaven, that's who revealed it to him. So Peter makes this astounding, awesome statement. One of the few times he didn't put his foot in his mouth in the scriptures. And and about who Christ is, that he's the Messiah, the Christ, that he's the son of the living God. And this was spiritual wisdom that came from the Father. And Jesus goes on, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus, this passage has been Um, caused actually a lot of division in the church. And so I want to walk a little slowly through it so that we can get some clarity on exactly what Jesus is talking about here. And I tell you, you are Peter. Peter, the word there is Petros. It means a single stone. And on this rock, Petra, Petra is bedrock. It's what you build your house on. And on this rock, I will build my church. And so some have interpreted that Peter is the rock that the church is built on. That's actually the route that the Catholics take. And I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. Because the Petra is the bedrock. Peter is a single stone. Yes, he's important in God's mission. But the bedrock that Jesus is going to build his church on, I believe is a statement that Peter just made. That Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And as people come to the knowledge and faith in that reality and in that alone, Jesus is going to build his church on that truth. And I love how Jesus ends this passage. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus says, this is going to be an unstoppable thing here. I'm building a church. By the way, this is the first time the word church is used in the New Testament. 
And Jesus says, I'm building a church and it's going to be bashing through the gates of hell by the power of the gospel that is shared with sinners and they repent, they place their faith and Jesus is going to be set free. This is, this is not the gates of the church. This is not a, a defensive measure for the church. This is an offensive measure where the, the church is going into enemy territory, behind enemy lines and sharing the gospel. And, and people come to faith and Jesus builds this unstoppable force in the world. And he uses this term, the gates of hell. Now remember, to the pagan mind of the day, this was the gates of hell. This is the backdrop. This is the area Jesus is in. And he's saying all this nonsense, all this despair, these gods can't do anything for you. I'm starting a hope-filled movement right now. Jesus' church is an unstoppable force. That's what he envisioned. So come back to our, our, our initial question. What do you envision when you think of the church? Jesus didn't have pews or stained glass or hymnals or, or ties and dresses in mind. In fact, in this passage, he didn't even have a meeting in mind. And I'm not saying meeting and going to church is bad. We should do that. We're actually encouraged to do that in scripture. But the idea behind Jesus' church is not a meeting. It's a movement of God. It's the gospel going forth. And here's what this can look like. You may have heard us talk about multiplication. It begins with you, right? The center circle here. And for a long time in discipleship, disciple making, what I would do is I would meet with one person. It's kind of hard to see the line between these, but I would meet with one person. And I'd pour into that person. And I'd pour into that person. And eventually, over years, it would kind of pitter out. But the vision that Jesus has of this unstoppable movement is that as you pour into others, who pour into others, who pour into others, and we become disciples who make disciple makers. That's this unstoppable force. That's this movement of God. That's Jesus's vision for the church. So how does that line up with your vision? Does that jive with how you view the church? And Jesus is unpacking this whole reality for his disciples of this multiplication movement of this mission of God, this movement of God that's going to transform the world. Unstoppable. Gates of hell can't stop it. And a couple verses later, he begins to tell them how he's going to actually bring this about. And understandably, they're confused. Let's look at it. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So he's telling them like, hey, this unstoppable movement, it's going to begin with suffering, death, and eventually resurrection. And understandably, the disciples are like, what are you talking about, man? Like you just said, you're going to build something. Dead people don't build stuff. And so Peter, of course, always so quick to, to respond. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Can you just laugh at the audacity of Peter? He just acknowledged that Jesus is God. And now he's like, hey, buddy, come here. I've got some advice for you, okay? You know, that last question you asked me about who you are, I nailed that thing. I got knocked out of the park. I'm on a spiritual mountaintop right now. Let me give you some advice. And here's what he says. He rebukes Jesus and says, far be it from you, Lord. <laughs> he, he sounds super pious, Lord. Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. What? The way that Jesus is gonna bring this church about, he, he's so struggling with, he says, far be it from you. But he turned and said to Peter, Jesus is going to go toe to toe here for a second. Peter rebukes him and Jesus meets rebuke with rebuke. He says, get behind me, Satan. Now, this is not because Peter is Satan or Peter was possessed by Satan. The words that, Je that Peter spoke were satanic in nature. It's the same temptations Jesus dealt with at the beginning of his ministry that now are coming through his close friend. You don't have to do it this way. There's another way. And he says, you are a hindrance to me for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And ever since 
Jesus accomplished this work he just told his buddies he was going to accomplish. Ever since that day, the church has been an unstoppable force to be reckoned with in the world. And there is a mission that you and I are invited into. And today I'm going to have Pastor Ed come up and we're actually going to have a conversation about what this whole thing can actually look like played out in day-to-day life. Welcome, Pastor Ed. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, So to start off with, we talk about this movement of God. We talk about this mission of Jesus, of disciples making disciple makers, multiplication. Why is this so important? Boy, that's a great question. I think it's because we just don't get it. I mean, when we think about a church that is gathered at a place, we think about a meeting, uh, boy, we just miss this unstoppable church. We, it, I mean, it can be stopped. I mean, uh, you can close the doors, lock the doors, and a lot of people think the church is stopped when we can't meet. But Jesus had that vision of this unstoppable, uh, just uh, multiplying movement of God on earth that just is incredible. He, he's look, he, he sees this followers of, of Jesus who is, um, who is on mission every day where they work, where they live, where they play, and, uh, and, and the power and the work of God is being done on earth all over as the church is scattered. It's gathered so that we can be prepared and sent out every day for, a, for the ministry. Yeah, I love that. And I love the, the picture of everybody getting to be a part of this, right? We want this to be the DNA of our church, uh, people helping people find and follow Jesus. And the cool thing is that all of us have that sphere of influence you're talking about, but we also have different gift mixes. We have different abilities and talents. And so you have different gifts than I do. Yeah. And, and I may have different gifts than you do. And so when we go into those spheres, we can uniquely engage the world in, our, uh, in this mission and according to the mixed gift, a gift mix that we have. Yeah, and I, I think we you know, kind of summarize the church. Uh, the church is the people of God who are filled with the spirit of God to carry out the mission of God. And so this whole idea of you know, people saying, I just... You know, I don't know if I can make that impact. Well, if you've got the spirit of God in you, there's, you're unstoppable. Yeah. You've got the power of God in you. And, and I think that's just one of the challenges to this whole process of being the idea of, you know, coming. At the, well, I can come and I can learn. And I want to learn and I want to learn. But it, no, it's your turn to go. It's, it, we're, we want to help you and develop you so you can be a disciple maker right where you're at in your home and where you work in your neighborhood. Yeah, I love that that I don't do this alone, right? Like that is such an overwhelming idea. But the spirit of God who is in me, who wants to impact the world through me, he's with me at all times. He's he's ever present. And so I'm not doing this alone. First of all, I have the spirit. Second, I have the community of the church. Like we get to do this thing together. And it's a co-mission. So, so, I understand the importance. So what's the difference? We've always been a church that's about disciple making, right? It's always been a part of our DNA. Um, And now we're saying we want to be a church that's not just about disciple making, but about uh, making disciples who make disciples. Mm -hmm. What is the difference there? Yeah, it's, it's really about finish line. I mean, you were talking about it earlier, how you would pour into somebody for a period of time and at that time went on and on. And it's, you know, it's great. Where does disciple making stop, you know? Um, but it's the finish line where, um, and I have done this now um, over the last couple of years where I'm now creating a different finish line from just meeting with somebody for a long, long time. But, um, but coming to a place where it's, it has an end date, it has an end date. Jesus spent three years with these disciples and there was an end date. He handed the baton and he left and left him with the spirit to carry out the multiplication process. So there is a, a start date. There's an end date in the sense where you are now ready and you actually hand the baton to them to say, go make disciples just like you and I have had this relationship. So there's an end date. There's a, there's a length of time. Um, sometimes it's a six months, maybe it's a year, but you've gone through a process with somebody where they have in turn can go through a process with somebody else. 
Yeah, I love that, the, the end date. But it doesn't mean uh, a severing of relationship, right? It, it's an ongoing coaching. It's, um, there's a guy who I, I was in a discipleship group with over the summer, Brandon. And uh, now he's leading a discipleship group. He was, he was you know, scared to jump into it, but he did it. He, and, and he's growing. God's growing people through him. And though the end date came and now he is living out the mission, we still have relationship and connection. It's not a severing a relationship. It's a releasing into the mission. Right. Awesome. Exactly. Very cool. Um, so, so you've experienced some of this over the, the years. What has it been like to experience the movement of God like this? Yeah, I think of uh, a man named Wayne that um, was drugged to my life group. And he, his wife wanted him to attend and he was uh, kind of, uh, didn't like to be around people. And, and so finally he attended and he and I went out for lunch and then he and I began to build this relationship and we would meet weekly. And uh, as we worked through some of the challenge that Wayne had, he was stuck in, in his walk with God and he was just in a very dark place. And, and there was this spiritual breakthrough that happened. And it was just incredible to see him come to life. And what that did to me to see that how God was doing incredible things to bring breakthrough to him. It wasn't, you know, that I had the skill. I could just see how God was working. And um, as he had breakthrough, I can remember there was a, a point where he began to come faithfully to our group. But what's really interesting is when he started opening his home and inviting men to his house. And I would come over and I'd stop in and see him. And he, and he would tell me all about the guys that were coming and being with him. And I was going, wow, I thought you didn't like to be around people, you know? And here he is, this spiritual breakthrough. He's growing He's and he's growing by discipling these other people. And I, I'm just kind of, sad that he was 72 when that all happened and what it would have been like if he would have started earlier in his journey. But man, all the way to the end of his life, he was this disciple maker. And it was, I just, he made such an impact on my life for being, uh, you know, being a part of the journey with me. That's awesome. The story of, of God's healing and deliverance from the stuckness, you know, and, and that's a real problem at times spiritually, we just get stuck and, 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 and it's hard to play in the game. I'm not a sports guy, but I'm going to use a sports metaphor for a second. It's hard to play in the game when you got a broken leg, right? And, and, and so you may be hearing mission and, and multiplication and making disciples all the while. There's a deep wound in your heart that God really wants to transform. And so if that's you and you're in that place, we have a, an amazing care ministry here that's headed by Shauna Murphy, uh, a great woman of God who her heart really is to help people who are stuck um, get out of their stuckness because there is hope on the other side of that. So if that's you, I, I highly encourage you, let us know on your Connect card or reach out to us or Shauna, um, and we'd love to help you process through that. But so we've heard, we've heard why this is important. We've heard what the difference is. The finish line's changing now. So when is someone ready? I don't think people ever feel like they're ready. I mean, at the points... And, and so I just, I feel like, man, I, I have so much to figure out on this. Um, and I just recently took a group of guys through this um, six month process with the intent that they would know at the end, they were going to be handed the baton to carry that out. And I can remember as we came to the end and we talked about it for weeks before that um, this is the last meeting, it's over. I'll be a coach from this point, but you are now, commissioned to be the disciple makers. And it was, I could, I kind of felt what Jesus did when he was leaving earth and these guys are going, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, kind of like what you were saying about Peter. No, this can't be. And I just said, it's, you have everything you need to make a, to, to start making disciples. And I just think about how many people have been to church and have been to heard messages, have been to life groups, have, and, and they have so much knowledge and so much that they have experienced that, that you're ready. You're ready to, to serve and to share and to sit down and share what you know, of the spiritual breakthroughs of what God has done in your life. And you're just sometimes like, ah, but I'm not ready. I need a class. I need, I... no, the spirit is in you. I am commissioning you go. 
Yeah, I love that. What I'm hearing, you know, if we think in categories of our spiritual pathway, right? We have the, the seeker, the student, the servant, the steward. And, and the student often, uh, I felt as a student, it's like, I got to get to a steward before I can start pouring into anybody or I might mess this whole mission thing up, right? But the student, if you have spiritual life, you have something to pour into others. And so uh, you, you can pour into those who don't know Christ. You don't have to have all the answers. I remember when I first started going to church I'd, and they talked about discipleship, I thought, well, I don't have all the answers. I can't answer all the atheists and the Buddhists. And I don't know everything about the Bible. I don't have enough memorized. But if you have spiritual life, the spirit of God lives in us mm-hmm. and he wants to pour into others through us. So it's amazing. So, yeah. So uh, thank you so much, Ed, for, for joining me, man. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so, so we've heard it, right? We've heard, this is the mission right here. People helping people find and follow Jesus. And, and, and think about what Ed just said for a moment. Uh, Jesus, he's going to leave the earth. He's got this grand mission. He's got this church he's going to build. It's going to be unstoppable, right? And he's going to leave the earth. What did the disciples feel in that moment? terrified. Like, what? How are you going to go and leave us? Jesus left his mission with a bunch of buffoons. And guess what happened? God used them. God used them so much. And throughout the generations, he's continued to use people to the fact that you and I have been impacted by this unstoppable church. So what are you feeling right now? Maybe you're feeling like the disciples felt when Jesus left. Maybe you're feeling like, I don't know about this. I see that Jesus has called me to this, but there's some fear or there's some anxiety or there's mixed feelings. I want you to know you can do this. God is in, is in you. If you're in Christ, the spirit lives in you and he will empower you to live out this mission in a powerful way. So I'm going to release to the campuses and have the campus pastor just give you a a challenge and a next step. Love you guys. Thank you again so much for sticking around. I appreciate you joining us for the new year and what God's going to do in and through you uh, in this new year. And we really want to challenge you with just a couple ideas from what we talked about today. So God has called all of his people to be on this unstoppable mission. So here's the question. Who is God calling you to disciple? Who is it in your sphere of influence? It's where you live, where you work, or where you play. Who is it in your sphere of influence that God is calling you to disciple? If you don't know, that's okay. Start praying. Remember the beginning of our bless rhythm we've been talking about for the last nine months or so. Begin in prayer. God, who do you have for me? Who, 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 do, who should I be impacting? Who do I have influence over and how can I use that influence to point them to you? Uh, The other day, Pastor Ed said a very haunting statement. He said, people are following you. Where are you leading them? What kind of disciples are you making? You are making disciples. Are they disciples of Christ? So I I, I challenge you just to begin praying. God, who, who is it that you want me to pour into? And then the second challenge is maybe you're sitting here and you're like, that sounds great, but I've never even been discipled myself. I don't know what this looks like. I need a model for this. We'd love for you to mark on your Connect card, uh, on the online Connect card or at your campus. um, Mark on your Connect card if you'd like to get into a disciple-making relationship to begin to see what this could look like and what God might do in and through you. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you sent your son. Like that is just astounding. You sent your son for broken, sinful people like myself. And and you sent him on a rescue mission, yes, but you sent him to start a movement in the world where hope would be reigning in the darkness of this world. And you call us to be a part of that. And that's that's scary, God. And so I, I pray as we hear your call into mission, that our hearts would be captured for your mission, that our minds would be enraptured by the movement of the church that Jesus talks about in this passage. 
and that you would give us clarity, God, on our next step, of, on who it is we're, we're called to disciple and on, on, on how we're going to begin that relationship, how we're going to begin to pursue that. And God, thank you that you have given us your spirit, that you, God, dwell in us by your spirit. And, and we're not doing this thing alone. And so I pray that as we endeavor to share the hope of Christ with others, as we make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, I pray that we would see you move in a powerful way that people would look at and say, only God could have done this. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. Thanks again so much for joining us. Have a good Sunday.